Well, thank you, Keith. That is, uh, that is quite a vision. That is quite a project. And it sounds like you do have uh, all the answers. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. And if you'd like to ask a question, please come to one of the six microphones that we have in the aisles. And if you could just tell us who you are and where you're from and uh, who you might like to direct the question to. So please don't be shy. I know there's, uh, there must be a host of things in your mind after hearing these three great presentations this afternoon. But look, I, I might just kick it off quickly because, Keith, it was incredibly convincing. It seems wonderfully well thought out. And you seem to have all the answers about water. But that's what I want to ask you about, Peter Stone, because um, obviously that's a, been a big focus of what the CSIRO is on about. Now, Keith and his project, it looks really good. And there is a lot of water in that water system. But this is a hostile environment. The evaporation rate is many times the, uh, the uh, precipitation rate. Have they got the answers, in your view? And I know that's putting you on the spot, but it's, uh, it's a really important question because water is the key to it all, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we, we haven't actually analysed that specific proposal, and, and we need to do that hmm. to, to answer that question. Um, what we have done is create the tools that you can use to, to design, analyse and test. Uh, exactly the sorts of things that, that Keith's talking about. But, you know, d deeper water storages, less evaporation, yep. as Keith was saying, yep. off-river storages, a different approach to the actual game of agriculture. D does, it, does it make sense conceptually to you? Yeah, uh, certainly um, uh, deeper storages are, are important in the north. It's one of the challenges of capturing and stor particularly storing water in the north is having enough left in your reservoirs when you want to use it. Mm. So depth, depth is important. That's been one of the um, keys to the success of, of Lake Argyle as a, as a water storage. It's, it's nice and deep. Mm. Uh, even a deep storage like that, though, loses 25% um, of its volume just, just to evaporation each year. So it's, it's, a, it's a feature of, of the north. Keith, do you have all the answers? We need science to support what we're doing. There is a rule of thumb, a generally accepted rule of thumb in Australia, that you can harvest, at least some people call it two thirds, one third, that you can harvest a third of the flow from a system and still retain its, um, uh, its ecology. Uh, we're only proposing 10%. And 10% growth, uh, you know, 10%, uh, we don't need 10%, but that includes the, uh, uh, the exercise we've done on evaporation. So what we would say is that it's eminently sustainable. Science will have to support that. That's as part of this process that we've got to go through. Um, but it's um, eminently sustainable, and there's plenty there for other people as well. Will it get up, the project? Yes, I've put, uh, I've put that much bloody effort into this. <laughs> I'll, but not only me, some of the others even more so. Uh, mm. There's so much intellectual effort and hard yards have gone into it, yeah, as well as hard cash, dare mm. I say. But I see it as, I'm not into things for money anymore. It's, um, um, I'm just interested. Uh, I, I grew up in that part of the world. Mm. Uh, I grew up on a tobacco farm, you know, peasant existence on a tobacco farm. My father was born in Croydon in 1901. My mother came out from England um, with a, a, a father-in-law, Australian father-in-law, um, in, after the First World War to Kidston. Um, so, <laughs> which is all in that particular area. And then I grew up in Marybid in Beulah. I'd just really like to see, uh, as we say, bringing government policy to life. You just have to do it differently than you did it before. Analyse everything that's been done, find out why it didn't work, and say, well, is there a way to make it work? And we believe we found it. Well, certainly there's no doubting the, uh, the enthusiasm, the passion, the vision that you and Sandra have for Northern Australia. But I'll take some questions from the floor now. Gentlemen at the front here. Uh, I think it's on. I, I could hear you. Ian Baker. I'm from uh, NT Farmers. We're probably the only really successful group that's been farming in the north. I've been a farmer up there for 30 years. We're, we're running a conference. I'm just giving a bit of a plug. I think Lee might be involved in this. He's already given us a bit of a plug um, on, on Northern Ag. Uh, in November. I know Peter and, uh, and Keith are both involved and, and lots of others. Um, so we we'll just give a plug for, there's, a, there's, a, post, there's a, a postcard out on the ABEAR stand. So it's, it's a group of farmers who are trying to bring business people, government agencies and key pollies together because I think the politicians have changed the environment for us 
uh, in creating a new environment. Now, another comment is, is to compliment Sandra. I think Sandra's right. We look east-west, and we need, to stop, we need to start thinking about India, um, Indonesia, other, other tropical regions. I think Sandra's fundamentally right, is uh, how do we liaise with other parts of the tropics um, rather than a lot of the discussion has come from southern Australia. We need to, in the north, look to other parts of the tropics. I think Sandra's on the ball. As Tony Jones would say, I'll take that as a comment. Uh, up the back, Seth. Yeah, Richard Dickman, uh, Bayer Crop Science, and I'll, I'll follow on from that, actually. Uh, my colleague this morning um, uh, from Brazil uh, described what happened uh, in Brazil. They've increased over 30 years their production by almost 400% uh, by going into the Cerrados. So my question is actually, it's going to be for Peter. Um, so that area is, you know, tropical uh, woodland or tropical uh, savanna woodland with uh, deep lateritic soil, you know, impoverished uh, soils, and, and they've gone into, you know, rain-fed um, tropical agriculture. Um, did your report seem to focus quite a lot on the on the irrigation aspect? I mean, have you considered, and maybe I'm wrong, I, I haven't read the report, but have you considered the potential for that sort of broad-scale, tro you know, tropical rain-fed agriculture? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, our report looked at, uh, uh, in the Flinders and Gilbert catchment, or, uh, going into the Gulf, looked at both dryland and irrigated ag opportunities. I should point out, um, part of the reason that water storage is so valuable in this neck of the woods is that the rainfall is incredibly unreliable. So I'll just give a, a little picture of that. In the Flinders catchment, which is uh, you know, Huondon, Richmond, Cloncurry area, the average annual rainfall is about 500 millimetres a year. Uh, if you go to any part of the globe that has 500 millimetres of rainfall a year, you cannot find one in which the annual variability of rainfall is as great. Uh, the Gilbert catchment has an average of about 775 millimetres a year. Again, uh, if you look around the world at an area with 750, 800 millimetres of rainfall, you can't find one that has a coefficient of variation in rainfall as high. So incredible variability in the annual uh, rainfall in these areas. And a detailed assessment of the rain-fed um, uh, cropping opportunity showed that you could expect a break-even yield of a mainstream crop like maize one or two years in 10. If I can say, uh, Brazil is a much more fertile and um, well-watered country than Australia. I mean, Brazil is, is a place from an agricultural point of view that's really worth seeing. Mm. Uh, it's just extraordinary. It makes your, makes your eyes spin when you, when you get there. So, um, I mean, all of that sugar cane, they grow um, rain fed uh, more than 10 times what Australia grows. Um, so it's just extraordinary. I, when I was in Brazil, when I was chairman of Queensland Sugar, I remember just saying, gee, everything is wonderful here. I said to one of the Brazilians, he said, yes, God gave us everything. He said to even it up, he sent the Portuguese here. <laughs> that was said by a Portuguese Brazilian, not me. Was there a follow-up question? Yeah, and actually kind of another question for Peter. That, that in your talk, you talked about groundwater capabilities, but you also mentioned surface water. Um, and I'm just wondering how is, are you looking to capture the surface water by dams? Is it gonna, how, where would you put the dams? It, you know, how is the surface water to be captured and used? against the background of what you're talking about. Yep. Um, so look, in our analysis, it depended on which catchment you were in. Uh, the, the Flinders catchment, uh, very flat. Um, uh, an average gradient of about one in 10,000 uh, across the landscape, so, so a very flat landscape. So the actual opportunity to have in-stream uh, dams, water storages there, or even diversionary structures I is really limited. Uh, so, so what we scoped out for the Flinders catchment was off-stream storages uh, into which uh, you pump during periods of, of peak flow in the river system. Um, the Gilbert catchment is a different kettle of fish. So it's uh, got uh, much more uh, elevation and so there are places there where you can very easily put in either dams or diversionary structures uh, to, to actually catch water and then either divert it or, or, or store it. So it really depends on the, on the landscape, uh, the, the, uh, the water flows, and really importantly, when you're thinking about water storages is, what do you want them for? So you actually design a given water storage for a given use and a given environment. 
So, so there's not a simple answer. It, it depends. You, you design fit for purpose and fit for environment. Mm. Sandra, one of the things that you said that really kind of resonated with me was the need to um, be more outward looking when it comes to a vision for Northern Australia. Now, regardless of what you might think of the details of, of Keith's proposal, is this the sort of thinking that you're alluding to? Look, my sense is that we need to think differently and bigger and more courageously and more in context, in global context. And, you know, my sense is that all of these ideas sound fabulous to me and then, you know, we need to test them and see what science makes of them, see where the markets can support them. But I think it's well worthwhile thinking about, from the tropical point of view, you know, if, if we'd had more time, um, there's a really interesting... Um, rationale about why it is we've lost this, this tropical idea. And it does go through history from that Aristotelian sense that really the only place where civilised human beings could, you know, could exist was in the temperate zone. And there we have this long legacy in the West in particular in thinking about the tropics as either a place of paradise, you think about Gauguin, you know, yeah. or a place of pestilence. And part of the challenge about opening our minds to new business opportunities and new potentials, but making sure they're grounded in science, is really to expose, I think, some of that thinking and, I, and identify that for us, and particularly in Northern Australia, we should be having a fundamentally different conversation than that which perhaps drove the Ord and other schemes that perhaps failed. Um, it seems to me that we are at a moment in history where we have real potential to do something significantly different and we should grasp it. Do enough of us think in that way, though? Is that, is that part of the challenge, too? I think it is part of the challenge, and, and I do think that if any of us feel that way inclined, the challenge is an individual one about, you know, what do I do about this? And I guess that's part of what drove the State of the Tropics report, is to try and answer that question. How do we challenge ourselves geopolitically? How do we think differently about the potential of Northern Australia, Northern Queensland, of course, that drove me? And, and while I don't have uh, the credentials of a, a Keith uh, De Lacey, of course, in terms of my background, I said to you, I'm from Melbourne and, and Canberra, I always say that I'm a North Queenslander, a Northern Australian by choice, you know. Uh, it seems to me, you know, what we do need to do is we have to think very courageously and boldly and differently, and now is the time to do it. I think the political climate is right. Mm. It seems to me that part of the challenge for us is to get some of our southern, southern cousins across the line on that. Mm, that's a good message. Now, we still have a little bit of time, so please, I'd welcome any questions from you. But get into trouble if we leave it for government to tell us what to do. Um, this is something now for private people and business to take up, take up the challenge and mm. do it. The government, of course, we need their assistance, particularly during the regulatory process and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I think too often we've sat back and let government sort of lead the way on all of these uh, kind of projects. Um, and not many of them have worked. Is Sandra correct though, Keith? Is, is the environment now right for this kind of thing? Because one of the things that you did make a point of saying was regulation is, is such a big issue. And that's been a bit of a theme of some of the sessions that I've been to here at Outlook this year. Do we have the right political climate at the moment to help private enterprise do what you're suggesting? Uh, with, without getting party political, it's hard to say it without being party political, I suppose. The environment has certainly improved um, at a state level quite dramatically. Um, and the, the right things are being said at a federal level. Mind you, every government in the Western world talks about reducing red tape, but no one's done it yet. Mm. So, uh, you know, um, the talk is right. Let's see if they can walk the talk. But no, the environment is much better than what it was for these kind of projects. If I might just add um, to that point, you know, I, I agree. You know, it seems to me that the market, we're, we're trying to expose new ideas for the mm. market to gain greater confidence to potentially step up. But we don't want to forget also we have long-standing uh, scientific and education assets. And what's more, you know, part of what I like to remind people up our way is that we've had people who for generations have worked and 
built things. They have been educated, they have delivered services in rural, remote areas that in fact is quite translatable to the rest of the world. So part of it also is owning the power of what we already know how to do. So I agree, and I think it's characteristic, certainly of people of northern Queensland, and it's a characteristic that I like to think I sort of share. You don't wait for governments, you know, you've got to get on and do some things. Um, but I do think the context right now is good. But let's not forget the education and scientific assets that we have at our disposal as well. And Peter Stone, with all of your work, uh, are you erring on the side of caution? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, our, um, our most recent reports have, have identified a significant... Uh, Keith's a bit more bullish, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, our, our most recent work identified the capacity to add 30% to, to the North's irrigation stock. Mm. That's significant. It certainly is. Well, I think you'd agree, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a really fascinating session. We've had three very different speakers this afternoon with different messages and points of view uh, on the future of Northern Australia. And is now indeed the time? Has circumstance never been better for something of real significance to happen in terms of development in Northern Australia? I guess uh, we'll have to wait and see, as they say. Terribly cliche of me. But look, it is time for afternoon tea. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you to our speakers, Peter Stone, Professor Sandra Harding and Keith DeLacy. Please give them your thanks. <laughs>